Hi, so in the videos 1034 and 1035, what we did basically was make this, which is a flux switching generator. Now that really got me thinking, so I've done some of the work and I'm going to go through it step by step because I think it's of interest and I'd like people to be able to replicate it. Now, with that in mind, I've made the whole thing out of one of these, which is a microwave oven transformer, and I've used no welding. All I've done is saw it. If you take off these coils and separate them out, what you get is a whole bunch of E's like that and a whole bunch of I's like that, and they're all in one block. If we saw that central tang out there, then we get something that looks like that, and if we can put an eye on it, we get this metal square. Well, that's exactly what I've got here with a whole load of neodymium magnets in there. They're pretty powerful magnets, but I can separate them out, and we've got our U and our I, and they go together. Now, when they're together like that, then they do something that everybody knows what they do, and there's no total surprise about it at all. So if I pop them together, there we go. There we go, got it. A little bit of steel here, and absolutely nothing. Now, you saw me putting them together. These are very powerful magnets, and there's quite a lot of them. But what happens is the magnetic flux is contained with this iron ring that we've done, so the north flows here, to the south there. We've got magnetic flux containment. That's a magnetic, uh, a magnetic circuit, as it happens. And it means that there's no flux escaping outside, so it can't pick anything up. We've got no magnetic field there. It's all inside. Now, everybody knows that, and it's the same thing that you, put, you do when you put keepers on. Now, here's another interesting thing that everybody also knows. That's an electromagnet. What it is, is a bunch of these eyes, and I've wrapped a coil around a little bobbin of it, and the coil I got from the microwave oven transformer. It's the primary. The primary is actually unwind really nicely so you can recover it. Not sure how many turns I've got on, but there's 50 grams of primary copper wire. Got two of them. And that one, if I apply a current to that, we make an electromagnet. So I'll put a bit of current on. Okay, so there's my benchtop power supply. I've connected it to my uh, coil, and if I give it a bit of power, so it's got about six volts going through it. And pressed up, we've got an electromagnet. Turn that off. Oops. There we go. Electromagnet goes away. Obviously something everybody knows yet again. But it occurred to me, wouldn't it be interesting if we put those coils on there? What would happen? Would it, all that we get is a lossy transformer? I don't know. So let's see. Okay, so I've wired up my coils in parallel and stuck them on that metal U, and what we've got is an electromagnet, and they're wired so that both of these poles are north. Now, when we turn that on and we supply it with a DC voltage, it is going to create an electromagnet, and those two poles will be south. It'd be nice to know what kind of force is being generated. Now, we don't have expensive meters to be able to measure that, but we do have this. This is a deviation meter. Actually, what it is, is a mass on the spring. When in reality, it's two of these eyes glued either side of a hacksaw blade and stuck into a bit of acrylic, but it will do the job. If I line my magnet up like that and I put some current in, we'll get a amount of deviation which is proportional to the magnetic field. The magnetic field obviously being generated is proportional to the number of turns and the amp supplied, because it's amp turns is what uh, generates EMF. So we'll be able to get some measure that will allow us an internal yardstick of how much force we're generating when we put a certain amount of volts and currents in there. So let's have a look at that. Okay, so I hope I've got everything in. There's our weight that we're going to deviate. There's the electromagnet there, you can see it's quite close. And here's the voltage reading. I'm going to swap so you have an overhead view. So I'm going to put some volts on, have an overhead view and see the deviation. And there's the voltage and amp draw required to do that. Okay, that was kind of fun. <laughs> what it's telling us really is that this is a very poor electromagnet. If I take my neodymium magnets, incidentally, and hold them not particularly close, we get a really strong deviation because obviously they're very strong magnets. Of course, why bother with all of this? Well, the question is, what would happen if I put these two together? When there's no current flowing in the coil, then of course we'll have no magnetism, there'll be no deviation. But if we put current in those coils, the question is, will the permanent magnets assist in that deviation? Let's have a look.
And there's the voltage required to do that, the voltage in the amps. Okay, so that may not seem earth shattering at first sight, but if we take a better look at it, then if we multiply the volts by times the amps, we get watts. Now the bare electromagnet some, took something like 19.2 watts for that deviation, and the switching operation took something like 4.8 watts. So it took about four times more to move that lump. Now, moving that lump a small deviation is doing work. So if you like, four times more work was done or a quarter less power was used to do the same amount of work. That's really interesting that we can get more work using permanent magnets. Now, obviously this flux switching gives us the ability to turn a magnet or a permanent magnet on or off. And a lot of machines don't work because they can't do that. Permanent magnets are on all of the time. But with flux switching, it looks like a small input of um, energy in terms of a current and that added voltage will allow us to turn the magnet off and on. And it assists to quite a degree with the work that a machine can do. Now, there's huge implications with that. I mean, motors, generators, all kinds of things. If we can assist them or we can utilize that to do real work, which is exactly what we saw with the deviation of the mass, then that's got to be fascinating. Now, there was a lot wrong with what I did. I mean, the deviation was quite small, so the error is going to be quite large. But a four times improvement, well, there's something there that convinces you to have a look, isn't there? The reason I made it so rough and ready out of lumps of stuff I found uh, lying around is so that it can be replicated. It's easy to make this, and it's something you can make quite simply at home, with nothing more than a microwave oven transformer and a hacksaw, to see if this effect is real or not, rather than just taking my word about it. And that's what science is. Science is about experimentation, about looking for yourself, about working things out and seeing what you can do. So I quite enjoyed that because it really made me think about whether we could use permanent magnets to assist or run a machine. I mean, you are looking at some really controversial things here. I mean, four times the power? You're thinking of unity, aren't you? You're thinking free energy. I mean, that is a heretical thing to say. <laughs> I really ought to go and wash my mouth out with soap now. But it was really interesting to see that simple effect from something we could knock together. Probably took me an hour to make that. Something we could knock together really easily. So if you're interested in it, try replication, see what you get, and I certainly will be looking at that a little bit more, I think. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video. I hope it sparked some ideas, and thank you very much for watching.